Thank you, girls. What a blessing uh, we receive every time our, our In His Step dancers um, provide their dance of praise. This morning, I'm going to be talking about money. I just wanted to get it out there. <laughs> and if you think that, um, and that's all preachers ever do is talk about money, um, you really need to talk to Jesus because 40% of all his parables dealt with wealth. He says a lot about giving. And so for the last four weeks, we have been uh, looking at what it means to be rich in deeds. And the scripture, the primary scripture for this sermon series it, call, it comes from Paul's first letter to Timothy, and he writes these words of encouragement to this young pastor, and he says, Command those who are rich in this world not to be haughty, not to be stingy, but rather to become rich in deeds, depending or trusting in the God who so richly provides. They are to do good works, to be rich in those good works, and generous, ready to share, so that they may have the life that is true life indeed. My first sermon, we talked about how rich is rich enough, and I know that most of us, uh, came that Sunday thinking, more than we have now. <laughs> and we think about rich people as being uh, somebody else, the, somebody who has more than we have. They're rich, but we soon discovered that somebody who doesn't make as much as we do thinks we're rich. In fact, when you look at all the uh, wealth of the combined uh, planet, uh, of the com combined population of this earth, we in America, all Americans, are in the top 4% of all wage earner earners 
on this planet. We are, in fact, the rich to whom Paul addresses. In my second sermon, I talked about the side effects of wealth, that with our wealth, there comes these temptations to place our, our hope, our trust, not in the God who so richly provides, but in our money, in the things that our money buys. Our loyalty to God can easily migrate to something else. And last Sunday, which was All Saints Sunday, I spoke about the living inheritance that those who have died in the faith have left us. They have given us a legacy, a foundation upon which uh, we build our own Christian faith. And this morning I want to I want to pose this question. How invested are you in investing your hopes in the lives of others? How invested are you in investing your hope in the lives of others? This morning our scripture lesson comes from Mark's gospel. I'll be reading from the 12th chapter, beginning at verse 38 through 44. Will you bow with me as we pray? O oh God, we ask that you would open up our hearts and minds by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that as your word is read and proclaimed, that we may hear within it the very living word of God for this day. For this we offer in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus was in the temple teaching and preaching. And he said, watch out for the legal experts, for they like to walk around in long robes they want to be greeted with honor in the markets. They long for places of honor in the synagogues and at banquets. They are the ones who cheat widows out of their homes to show off, they say, long prayers. They will be judged most harshly. Jesus sat across from the collection box for the treasury and he observed how the crowd gave their money. Many rich people were throwing in lots of money. Ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. <laughs> and one poor widow came forward and put in two small copper coins worth a penny. And Jesus called his disciples to him and he said, I assure you that this poor widow has put in more than everyone who's been putting money into the treasury. For all of them are giving out of their spare change. But she, from her hopeless poverty, has given everything she had, even what she needed to live on. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. The story is told of a young man who was down on his luck. He had no job. He had no place to stay. He was down to the last $10 that he had. And he wandered into a church one Sunday morning for the service. And as the preacher uh, got ready to receive the, the offering, he challenged the congregation uh, to give generously to the Lord and that God would bless them because of their blessing God. So something happened within the heart of that young man. He felt this, uh, this prompting to put in the $10 bill he had in his pocket. It was everything he had. Later on, he began to give uh, 
a testimony that his life changed after that moment. Doors of opportunity were open to him. He found a job, a place to live. He even was able to go back to school and further his education. He received even better salaries. In fact, he was so good at what he did, he started his own company and he became very wealthy, a millionaire many times over, all because he believed that he had given it all to God and God had blessed him in return. And of course, the congregation with res responded with a, a, a loud amen. And everyone, you could tell, was focusing their attention on him, admiring his generosity. When he sat down, there was a woman sitting next to him, an older woman, and she smiled and she said, that was a right fine testimony. It's amazing that when you had nothing, you gave all that you had. I dare you to do it again. <laughs> One day Jesus is teaching in the temple and he positions himself uh, directly across from the treasury, from the place where people would come and put their financial offering into the offering plate. He is watching the people give. And he said many people were giving large gifts, ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. And they were being celebrated. And you could tell that all who were around them were admiring them and kind of fawning over them because of the large amounts of money that they gave. But then he sees this older woman, a widow, who is destitute. She is so poor that all she has is two copper coins that are worth only a penny. And she places those into the offering plate with no fanfare. In fact, hardly anyone even notices. And it's at that moment that Jesus gets really excited. He says to his disciples, did you see what just happened? Did you notice what just occurred? This woman has given out of her poverty everything that she has and her offering is greater than the whole offering for that Sunday. And I want to say, really? Two pennies compared to $30,000? Are they really equal? In Jesus' mind, he does not judge us by the amount that we give. He judges our generosity in terms of our movement from the heart, the reasons why we give. Now, I have to tell you, this story makes me feel a little uncomfortable. Does it make you feel uncomfortable? There's only one person in the room who shook their head yes. The rest of you are asleep or you're liars. I don't know which is the case. But the part of this story that disturbs me the most is when Jesus condemns the legal authorities, the scribes, the Pharisees, those who walk along in long robes. Wait a second who love to be greeted with respect at the grocery store. I want you to meet our pastor. And when it comes time for the potluck suppers, most of you would say, Pastor, why don't you go to the front of the line? Or you should be seated at the head table. And so it is not lost on me that those of us who are 
uh, I hate to put it this way, professional Christians. That is to say that we have uh, given our life to work within the church. And in fact, that is where our livelihood comes because of the generosity of you. That Jesus, in effect, is saying, they've got it wrong. They've got it wrong the way that they're looking at our giving. You see, I sometimes hear people tell me, you know, well, the church is a business. We got payroll, we got taxes, we got maintenance on the buildings, we got to have utilities, air conditioning, lights, and we have programs we need to support. We have missions that extend that generosity to people all over the world. It takes money to run a church, and it does. And as the pastor, I have been charged, authorized, not only to preach the word and administer the sacraments, but I'm also authorized to order the church, that is to give the church direction to help set budgets and then to help raise those budgets, to recruit leaders and train them for the work of ministry. But Jesus isn't really concerned about that. In fact, I'm going to take a, a risk right now and tell you God really doesn't need your money. Now, some of you are going, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> I mean, why would we think the creator of all the heavens and the earth would need what we give? He owns it all anyway. But he does ask for us to respond in a way that puts our trust in him and not in our wealth. Now, friends, Jesus said that those who gave their large gifts were giving out of their pocket change. You know, I hardly carry change anymore, but I have to tell you, pocket change is usually not very much. But the widow, he says, was giving, giving out of her poverty and that her gift was larger than the total offering that day. Now, let me give you this example. There are a lot of very generous, wealthy people. And suppose that a, uh, a man whose net worth was $100 million, that's a pretty big chunk of change, right? Suppose he says uh, to our uh, finance chairperson, I want to give a million dollars to your church. Do you know what we would do? We would probably name a building after him. I mean, people can get excited when someone gives that kind of money. But look at what he's given. He still has 99 million left over. Would you like to live on 99 million dollars? Do you think you could get by on that kind of wealth? Even though he gave a large gift, Jesus would say, I'm not concerned by the number of zeros behind any other. Rather, I am concerned with the heart and with what percentage the giver is giving. You see, it makes sense to me that God would uh, be concerned about percentages because that's the way we think. There's a little conversation going on in Congress right now. It's called tax reform. And I know that makes a lot of you excited. Why? Because your tax bracket might go down with this new tax reform. Your percentage of what you are required to pay 
into the federal government of your earnings if it dropped several percentage points could make a huge difference to your budget. If you itemize your charitable contributions, I guarantee you're concerned about percentages. Or, or what about you go out to buy a house or a car and you go to the mortgage company or to the bank to take out a loan. Would it be smart to find an interest rate that's lower than the ones you found other places. What if you were to save one uh, percentage point off your loan over the course of 30 years? That could add up to a huge saving. Or what about the tip you leave on the table for your waiter? Generally, it's accepted that 15% is what we should be paying, uh, but for Far too many Americans, their giving is subjective. Uh, they base their giving on their <clears throat> total experience of the meal. And if the food isn't good, but the service was great, sometimes they cheat the waiter. They don't give 10% or 15%. They may give 5 they may give nothing at all. I have friends uh, that routinely, when they go out to eat, which is a luxury when you think about it, they never tip below 40%. In fact, many times, if not most of the time, they tip 100%. Because they know the hardships that these people have in their life because they've waited tables before. If you get your bill and you begin to subtract the tax from the bill and you pull out your tip calculator on your phone, you may have to ask yourself, am I really a generous person. Con percentages matter. It matters to us and it matters to God. You see, God may not want your money. I do. <laughs> I'm just going to be honest and upfront about it. God doesn't need your money, but he does need your heart. And when our hearts are turned towards God in a right way, we fulfill the image of God in which we were created. The Apostle Paul puts it this way in Ephesians 2.10. He says, For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time to be our way of life. We who know Christ are to be the most generous people in the world. Now, in a few moments, um, our congregation is going to do something that we do uh, every year. Uh, we are going to present our estimate of giving cards and put them down on the, uh, the communion rail. And we'll have a moment of prayer where you can dedicate what God has blessed you with to be a blessing to other people. Now, if you're a guest of our church, don't worry about it. We're not asking you to do that. We're only asking our members and our regular uh, church friends to make that kind of commitment, but we would covet your prayers as this is happening. If you've never given before, making an estimate of giving helps to make your giving intentional. Think about a percentage that you would want to dedicate to God's work. Not the amount, but the percentage. That can be the starting point for you. And if your income goes up, 
the amount you give will go up, and if your income goes down, the amount will go down. But it makes your giving intentional. And make your giving like a love letter to God or a thank you note for his generosity. It makes a difference in our hearts how we give. Secondly, make your giving a priority. The scripture teaches us that we are to set aside first fruits. What that means, we are to set aside uh, the first of our income for the Lord. Because what happens typically is we, we make our giving to the church last, then we're going to run out of money to give. We're going to look at what we have left in the bank account and say, you know, I just don't have enough this week, this month. So make it a priority, set it aside first. And the third thing I would suggest is make your giving regular. Now, some people still write checks. I can't believe it, but they do. In fact, I had one woman in the early service who admitted to it, and I said, you know, don't look in the rear view mirror when you're standing in the grocery line because everyone is gritting their teeth and mumbling under their breath. But Letitia and I have been uh, giving online for about 10 years, and what I have found is that it, it really helps me to make my, intentional, my giving intentional, and when I'm out of town, I know that my, my gifts, my offerings, are going to be there whether I'm physically present or not. Make your gifts intentional. Make your gifts a priority. And make your gifts regularly. Lastly, enjoy your giving. You see, when we are generous to God, we do so out of the joy that we feel for God. It is out of our appreciation for all that he has done for us. For after all, we have been blessed, and we are called to be a blessing for others to invest our hope, not in our wealth, but in the lives of other people. And if we do this, it will make all the difference in how we give. Friends, if you would take a moment, our, we're gonna remain seated as we sing our closing hymn. And you may come forward to leave your estimate of giving cards on the altar rail, or if you've already um, put it into the offering basket or turned it in early, just simply come and have a moment of prayer. Ask God to multiply these gifts so that we can do even more good together in the world.